Hey guys. Um, I'm doing this video non-scripted as well, but this happens to be a subject I know much more about. And you know, we're not talking about attention in general, so I have an actual path that I, I have talked about this numerous times with different people. It's practically routine by this point, plus I'm going through some specific studies and some other examples, so keep me on track anyways. Um, I left yesterday off saying I didn't know what the video was going to be on, and I obviously know. Earlier today, a friend messaged me uh, some shit about this psychologist that really shouldn't be a psychologist going around social media pushing the anti-vax thing. And me and him went digging through her history, even going to the extent of like reading her doctoral dissertation. Um, unsurprisingly, I somebody who's good at finding that stuff. Oh my god, it is bad. Really bad. But it, it became pretty clear this woman, despite several degrees and a doctorate in psychology, no medical training, is one of the anti-vaxxers, specifically the Vaccines Cause Autism group. Which means the very large amount of autistic patients that she claims to take on and support probably not doing the best of jobs. And I've had uh, some similar experiences in my childhood that you know, I'll talk a bit about, but I want to keep this mostly pretty general. So we're going to be talking about unintended consequences of therapy and malpractice. Um, some of it is going to border into abuse. Some of it was even considered human rights violations, because it was bad enough. Now, to go beyond abuse into actual human rights violations, getting recognized by the UN, uh, much more difficult. So you can imagine how badly somebody messed up, um, organization messed up, to uh, reach that level. Numerous therapies were tried for autism over the decades. Uh, I figure the formal recognition of the diagnosis has gone on for about a hundred years now. Um, been documented in literature for the earliest one that I know of goes back to Lutheranism. Uh, Martin Luther described a child that would have been what we now consider a level three. Um, but the earliest medical example I, I can think of goes back to a Civil War doctor from the United States Civil War. Um, who, honestly, I think had more or less the right attitude that civil life, ci um, city life, one great forum you can move out to the countryside, less social interaction, the better just focus on skill development, not social development, and they're going to be mostly fine. And they mostly were. <laughs> um, it never really got felt like a need to formally uh, describe the condition because it wasn't from any of the medical literature describing the symptoms. Not just the behavioral ones, but the all of the symptoms that I've talked about already, and some others that we will cover. These kids matched that, and it wasn't a problem for the longest time. In fact, you really only started to see... Oh, we'll cover that in the middle. Hans Asperger, fucking asshole for many reasons, but parts of his description of Asperger syndrome were... Pretty spot on. Noticed that these kids were less sociable, but there was a tremendous aptitude for the sciences. That's part of the stereotype we all recognize today, and it's not wrong. The three havens for the autistic stem, I'm including, well, yeah, tech is part of it, that's the T. Trade work and acting 
I'll get into that in another video. But yes, acting. The thing that you wouldn't think we'd be able to do well is one of the havens for employment when you're autistic. It's severely overrepresented in acting. You're probably, if you've watched the other videos, probably thinking, okay, and maybe I can see that. We'll get into more of my other video. Where you started to see the stigma towards autism get a lot worse was when a particular school of psychology, one that is very useful for the problems that it is meant to address, got applied to autism. Applied behavioral analysis from the behaviorists. I'm going to read a passage from one of these articles that I'm citing. This always links down in the video description. Um, but this is from uh, Eileen Herlinda Sandova Norton and others. Um, how much compliance is too much compliance? And there was... Applied behavioral analysis is a form of behavior modification that relies heavily on external reinforcement, both positive and negative, so the operant conditioning. ABA is intended to modify or diminish behaviors, as well as increase language, communication, social skills, attention, etc. in children with autism spectrum disorders. And, however, this conditioning only applies to one skill, and once they have mastered it, the conditioning subsides. Conversely, many children with ASD are taught the same task or skill for years using the same conditioning techniques, yet mastery is never met. Anybody who's done education, that should be a red flag. Like, either you're not going to get it at all, but there's plenty of autistic people who do, and numerous things. It seems to converge all to the same skill sets and perspectives and everything else. That doesn't seem to fit. Or we're approaching it the wrong way. Which, spoilers, approaching it the wrong way. And there was one other part of this. Where was it? Okay. In fact, schools, ABA specialists, and researchers are learning that such intensive and chronic conditioning has instead mounted to compliance, low intrinsic motivation, which is why the autistic who go through ABA are often described as lazy, whereas the ones who don't are actually out there leading the most productive lives that they are able to. And often rather productive lives, not necessarily in the workplace, that's a huge problem, but able to do a lot of things that they enjoy and, and, and just get satisfaction out of life rather than doing the bare minimum required to appease the APA therapist. And a lack of independent functioning. That one is a huge issue because we are talking about taking people who have a difference, a condition, if you are adamant in calling it that. That's fine for the purposes of this discussion. I'm not going to argue against that. But a condition that you can go through life with and be fine, be a productive member of society. This therapy was actually recognized to turn it into the disability that is widely known as. It's not autism that led to the disability, it was the treatment for autism that led to the disability. Again, sources down in the video description. One of the common things ABA proponents say is, oh, this really does help, and it's just your personal opinion that you don't like. But no, the science behind it is that it is bad. We'll get into a little bit on why and 
what we missed, but it is not our opinion alone. The latter of which is the presumed goal of ABA therapy in the first place, maybe dependent functioning. Perhaps because ABA therapy is considered effective in verbal children and in typical children for select tasks where it is legitimately useful. The assumption is that an even more intensive approach would be suitable for nonverbal and or lower functioning children with ASD. I'm trying to get away from that language. I use it sometimes, but the, the attention is we're moving away from that. Regardless, researchers have indicated numerous problems with the underlying theory of ABA. Um, not ABA itself. I, ABA applied to treating autism, because ABA is useful for actual behavioral problems. But we've gone over, and we'll talk about more in this video, a lot of these behaviors from autism actually have underlying internal things going on, and are either adapting to them, or results of them, or... We'll touch up on that. Specifically, unintended consequences, such as prompt dependency, among other issues. So, uh, prompt dependency is a requirement for the individual to be prompted to do something else. You see this in the workplace with individuals who have gone through ABA therapy, but it's essentially conditioning to the point that you need somebody else to tell you to do something because you essentially had your own sense of agency and self-directed uh, destroyed, which is a horrible thing to do to another person. And there's there's a lot more in this. I'm not going to read the whole article because that would potentially put me a copyright violation because then it's no longer transformative. But also, you you know how to read. You you read. <laughs> ABA, why I'm saying it's defensible, but not for autism. ABA originates from behavioral analysis. The idea is we don't know how to test for internal things, so we're only going to treat the external. Kind of see the problem. They look at everything as behaviors, and that's fine if it's a behavioral problem, but ignoring any internal things. I'm not going to repeat the things I've talked about in previous videos, but one fantastic one I can bring up, because behavioralists, um, especially the ABA guys, have a massive problem with it, and you just, you're going to understand why you shouldn't when I explain it. Rocking back and forth. I behavior that you need to teach the kid not to do. It's not socially appropriate. It's not, but what's going on that causes the need to rock back and forth? I've described sensory differences, anomalies, whatever you want to call it. Some people describe it as sensory modulation, some as synesthesia. There's evidence there's a lot of different things going on, and we don't know how to best characterize it. But it's clear that there are sensory things going on. One of those things that can happen is with your sense of balance. Since the balance gets thrown off, you start feeling like you're falling or otherwise moving when you know you are not. This creates a weird disconnect in the brain but it can't quite resolve it just on its own. Your ears, or rather the part of your brain that processes the inner ear, uh, your sense of balance, that's where that comes from. Something's whack at the moment. The motor parts of your brain are going, yeah, I'm not moving. I know I'm not moving. How do you resolve that? Well, we know from plenty of cognitive psychology experiments that if you have one messed up 
sensory stimulus. And you can present several more that agree with each other, but don't agree with the messed up one, that your brain will just start ignoring the messed up signal. You feel like you're moving when you're not. So why don't we try moving? This, for whatever reason, presents as rocking back and forth. And it works fantastically well. The feeling, the literally nauseating feeling, goes away. You rock for a few minutes, and you're fine. Clearly, this is not something ABA would help. This is not actually a behavioral problem. This is a behavior resulting from internal factors that behaviorism does not like to look into. So... Does that mean you should go rocking in back and forth in a chair in the middle of a restaurant? No. We can help sort of... I, look, I... In an ideal world, yes, you'd be able to. I would love a situation where all of these problems are so well understood that it's not stigmatized anymore. But the simple reality is we live in a world where tons of things are stigmatized, not understood, and t tons of other problems. I mean, look at how long mammary glands and breastfeeding have been a thing, and yet this is still a debated issue in society. So realistically speaking, you're going to be able to rock back and forth in the middle of a restaurant because you feel like you're falling when you're not. Now, what I do, and what a lot of people could easily do, go take, take a few minutes, step outside in your car, bathroom. Movement alone is often enough to do it. Take a walk around the restaurant. if it's not from that same sensory thing that I described. Talk about it. See what options people can come up with. See what you can do that is more presentable, but still meets your needs as well. If your child is doing this, talk to them. If they're nonverbal, I've talked about that in another video. You, computers are literally everywhere. Talk to them. Even if you're not getting feedback, I promise they understand you. Give a bunch of explanations, different options for how that could be addressed in a way that isn't going to get people giving them the evil eye. They can still meet their needs in a more appropriate way. That's better for everybody. Another one of the problems with ABA is it kind of implies that the reason, well, not kind of, I've literally just described that for several minutes, it does imply that you are wrong for being the way you are and that the reasons for why you do things don't matter. This has de severely debilitating effects on somebody's mental health. This has caused a very large amount of self-loathing, and there's some research that even found it considerably increases the uh, rates of PTSD in adulthood. This is not helping. It looks like it's helping, and it does help for several years, which is why for it, it got accepted and so prevalent. Longitudinal studies matter. And 
mm, a lot of research is really bad in longitudinal studies, but autism in particular is pretty bad when it comes to longitudinal studies. One of many complaints about autism research is that it often doesn't go beyond 18 years old. One of the biggest problems ABA causes or contributes to. I got plenty to criticize about ABA. To be fair, it does not cause this. It contributes to it. We could probably prevent this phenomenon. ABA is making it much worse. Autistic burnout. This is similar similar to professional burnout or depression, but it is a unique phenomenon. I'll talk about this in another video, maybe the next one. Um, the first burnout experience that an autist experiences is typically just after they turn 18. Usually about 18 to 20 is when it happens. Now again, if the effect efficacy of ABA is being analyzed in childhood and typically going no longer than till they're 18, they are missing the major negative effect that it has. So it looks like it helps for a while, for many years, but it doesn't. I gotta check a steak. I'll pick right back up after. All right, I got myself a full belly. So the I was talking about ABA, sort of finishing that up. Um, one of the other findings was that ABA also, instead of conditioning fixing the behaviors, because again, the behaviors have rather important internal causes, they're addressing symptoms that maybe should be treated, maybe just need to be learned to dealt with in a different way, had an, the unintended effect of conditioning the conditioning. What, the, what do I mean there? That instead of fixing the behaviors, the autists wind up learning about reward expectation, similar to the need to be prompted to do things. This can sort of be generalized as compliance. You're having your sense of agency, an incredibly important concept in mental health, beat out of you and you just sort of comply with the therapist. Which I'm going to actually make the pun here. In another video, we talked about the considerably higher rates of abuse towards the autistic, and this is sort of similar to that. See, you don't just wind up more compliant with the therapist. This is probably an additional confounding factor behind the compliance with the rapist. Yeah. One of the biggest strategies they have sh been shown to utilize when it comes to the um, anything DDID, so developmentally disabled or intellectually disabled, is exploiting rewards. And here you have a therapy literally setting them up for that, conditioning them to be reward-seeking, to be compliant with authority figures. Where ABA works is when you have things like oppositional defiant disorder, where there is a behavioral problem that needs to be addressed, where a higher degree of compliance is actually appropriate because their level of compliance is so bad that you're correcting it to a normal level. But if what you have isn't a lack of compliance, if it's not defiance, what are you really doing? Getting them set up for really not okay things. Now, in some cases, 
these approaches get taken to a much more extreme level to where it's not applied behavioral analysis anymore. It's abuse or human rights violations. I'm going to link to a video to a creator who does a much better job describing this, puts a lot more effort into her videos because that's how she makes her money. I don't make my money through these, so I don't put a crap ton of effort. I do a lot of work ahead of the video, researching things, but my editing, my... I don't edit most of these. <laughs> if I do, it's like color grading. Um, <sighs> Illuminati covers it. Autism's electri our Autism Speaks Electrifying Past. Uh, we'll get into autism support agencies, advocacy agencies uh, in another video as well. Autism Speaks is horrible. Uh, there are much better ones like AANE and ASAN. Um, the more interesting part of that video is with the Judge Rottenberg Center. Now, I'll follow up with that video. She describe sort of the history behind that, how it got named after a judge, the fucked up history there, but the important takeaway. And I don't think, I watched this a while ago, I don't think she touched up on this because this seems to be a more recent thing. Um, this is what I mean by the UN declaring somebody as guilty of human rights violations. Yeah. And there's some hefty implications there that the U.S. has to deal with that make some changes at the government level because of that. That's a whole messed up thing. But the other thing I'm going to do is link to a video of when a media uh, group, I think it was CBS, uh, first broke the story. Um, sort of what got the U.N. interested. Um, because they're essentially just tasing the shit out of autistic kids when they don't behave the way other people want them to. Which has beating a child or a spouse ever got them to behave the way you want them to? No, that's no. Why is escalating that to the point of tasing them to the point where they get burns going to address that? You know, we reserve those kinds of things for criminals to stop them in one of the least damaging ways possible. But they're criminals. This is being done to children that are not engaging in criminal activity. Any decent psychologist is going to tell you that that kind of environment is going to cause behavioral problems, not resolve them. The uh, cycle of abuse is pretty well known. You abuse somebody, they go on to abuse. That's creating the problem it's meant to resolve. It's also just ridiculously inhumane. Another less contentious than the JRC, but more contentious than ABA is on medications. Um, I'm going to get this out there immediately. I'm not opposed to medications for the symptom level, but I don't personally want to be cured of autism. I find, and many people in my life find, that the difference in perspective those particular skills are beneficial. It's sort of easier and better for everybody to learn to meet each other in the middle. Note, meet each other in the middle. There are some of the more hostile, younger, certain political affiliation, autists who are very hostile. I think everybody needs to meet them on their level. Incredibly opposed to any kind of treatment at all. 
I like the perspective I have on things. I like the specific skill. I have learned to use them to my advantage. Having an incredible attention to detail. Having a fantastic ability to focus on things that you find highly interesting, which there's a lot of work you can do with things you find very interesting. These are good things. There's even more beyond that, but you get the point. Chronic constipation? No, you treat that. You don't live with that. You treat that. But this is what I mean. I'm okay with treating some of the symptoms. Some of the stuff that barely anybody talks about, but some of the symptoms, some of the associated things. We'll cover legitimate medications first. The atypical neuroleptics, so atypical seizure medications. Um, as it turns out, Seizure medications are also useful treating psychosis. There are some, myself included, who are pretty sure that all episodes of psychosis are actually seizures. And this is because certain forms of temporal lobe epilepsy, or even just seizures that cross into the temporal lobe, will cause um, synesthesia or hallucinations. But that is a whole other thing, and that's not even strictly dealing with autism. Uh, but Neuroleptics, especially the atypical neuroleptics, have shown efficacy in the aggregate for reducing the irritability in autism. Now, neuroleptics have a rather major uh, cost to them. They're not the nicest of medications. So uh, I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. 20.8% of the time, behavioral problems in the autistic are due to the gastrointestinal issues, the constipation, decreased gastrointestinal Treat that first, rule that out. Because you can treat that without anything, really. <laughs> um, don't go high fiber diet. Uh, you, know, you can want to talk to a nutritionist if you're the parent. Do not do this. Go to a nutritionist who knows about this in particular. But um, guar gum has been shown considerably effective, whereas fiber tends to worsen the blockages or worsen the constipation to the point where you get a blockage. That's a huge problem. Then you have a medical issue instead of just constipation. Your child's going to the ER. Don't do that. Guar gum in appropriate amounts that a nutritionist would know how to do, um, or a gastroenterologist, that would be even better, um, has been shown effective. Uh, there are certain medications if it's more justified, but they're not laxatives either. Uh, long term laxative use will cause really bad problems. But if it's not that, And you can rule out, this will be another video, but, and you can rule out abuses going on, which you probably shouldn't. These atypical neuroleptics have shown, like I said, in the aggregate benefits. They have been shown useful in alleviating irritability that is not constipation, all that stuff. I say you want to be careful with this because if the child was abused, physically, sexually, whatever, and you're not aware of it, you're not actually addressing the problem in a healthy way. That needs to be resolved in a very different way than medication, uh, especially if you're dealing with the abuser. That's, you don't want to let that go. I'm not saying these medications are never justified. They are. There's some who have found tremendous benefit. Some who, they're full-grown adults and they keep taking them because they do genuinely believe it helps them. I'm not going to tell them it doesn't help them. I'm not them. You need to be careful with this, though, because 
and I haven't talked too much about autism at the genetic level. Um, so we're just going to really quick cursory overview. There are no genetic mutations associated with autism. But it is genetic. Okay? Okay? This makes sense, I promise. None of the genes are mutated. What instead happens is called CNV, copy number variations. This is where the gene, the correct gene, is duplicated or deleted to where it's present more or less times than it would normally be. So if you normally have, say, I'm just going to make some two copies of the gene that produces cytochrome P452D6. The autist might have only one of them, might have four of them. Cytochrome P452D6 still gets produced correctly. It's just that there's more or less of it than there should normally be. This is one of those weird areas where autism differs from how it normally is. See, as far as behavior and perspective and tons of other things, it converges into a very narrow category to where you can group autism very well based on how it presents, even though there's tons of internal things that you can't just see. You know, this, this is why it can be diagnosed strictly through behaviors. However, this is not one of them. I mentioned cytochrome P452D6 in particular, or CYP2, CYP2D6 for short. I'm probably just going to say the full thing. That's how my mind works. But it's a liver, liver enzyme? It's an enzyme. I believe it's produced by the liver, but it's responsible for metabolizing neuroleptics. Among numerous other things, it's an incredibly important enzyme. If the autist has more CYP2D6, this would actually mean that they need higher doses of the medication in order for it to be as effective as somebody who is not autistic taking both the uh, normal dose. However, if they underproduce it, this is going to cause the drug to build up and is going to cause problems, such as Parkinsonianism or serotonin syndrome, or it's a bit of a contentious term, akathisia, maybe better explained by already existing stuff, maybe a unique phenomenon. I'm not going to get into that, but the point is you may get adverse drug reactions under a normal dose because you have to measure the enzyme. Anybody who studied pharmacology watching this probably recognizes that I'm specifically talking about pharmacokinetics, which is taught as important stuff to learn, but we often, in medical practice, kind of ignore it. Because in the aggregate, it's fine for the autism. But the problem is, is the autists aren't falling a nice bell curve as far as this goes. It's widely varied, much more so than it would normally be. And so this throws a lot of medications. If you were the parent of an autistic child who is on or considering to be on these medications, push for measuring how much cytochrome P452D6 is present. Push for doing some blood tests um, in the months following up on, uh, on their being on the medication, just to make sure that the titrated levels are what they should be and that it's not building up. Or conversely, that there's not enough of it because it's over metabolized. In either case, you want to help and not do harm. So this is actually significant in that. But the, the underproduction and how that doesn't get looked at is enough of a problem that the normal rates, the difference um, of adverse drug reactions in the autists is about four and a half times more common than it is in uh, non-autists, the general population. 
this winds up also causing problems. Uh, I'll link to the article as well. It's not research, it's a um, more like media outlet kind of article. Um, but it sort of talks about this, how on Aripurpazole, the second generation atypical neuroleptic, um, used to be a really big thing for treating autism. Even that is being phased out because problems, um, but not as much as ABA. ABA is merely being thrown out. There are a lot of people that are like, fuck ABA. Aripurpazole will make bag for what, exactly what I just described. Um, one kid did fantastic, another kid had a severely adverse reaction, at nine years old was trying to stab himself in the head with a knife. No history of aggressive behavior before that. So, yeah. We need to be careful. This video has gone on long enough. I'll mention, I, I was planning on talking about my own experiences with a therapist uh, as far as this kind of stuff goes and what effect it had on me. I'll leave this uh, to another video because um, right now we're looking at about 40 minutes, which is longer than any of them have been. And I try to not do really long videos because um, the viewership sucks, but it is what it is. So. I don't know what the next video will be again, um, but hopefully you found this informative, helpful, all of that. Until then, have a good one, guys.